Thanks so much to Helen and Molly for this event. It's a real honor to speak here. Yep, and apologies if I uh, rush through, especially slides that echo what others have previously presented. But I, uh, I've got a lot of ground to cover, as you can see from the title. So I found this image really striking. This is an image from Hiroshima after the bombing, actually, but I just found it so remarkably similar to the post-tsunami uh, scenes that we all remember from two years ago. And of course, the comment has been made that even by the likes of the Prime Minister of Japan at the time, that the events of March 11th, 2011 are are similar in magnitude and importance as things like the Hiroshima atomic bombing to the Japanese nation. So this is a view of Fukushima Daiichi before the catastrophe began. And I was invited on a speaking tour of Japan in August of 2010, seven months before the catastrophe. And I stood on a bluff over the Pacific that uh, looked down on Fukushima Daiichi. My first stop was Okuma and Futaba on the speaking tour. So three and a half miles to the north, I could see the six reactors like this. And three and a half miles to the south from where I stood, I could see the Daini uh, nuclear power plant with four reactors. And uh, it's little known, but a single off-site power line is what saved Daini, more operating reactors than at Daiichi from a similar catastrophe. Several off-site power lines were lost to the earthquake. The emergency diesel generators were lost to the tsunami. And uh, that was the kind of scenario that Prime Minister Khan, his, at the time, Chief Cabinet Secretary Adano, admitted to the Rebuild Japan Initiative Foundation. And the headlines came out on the first anniversary of the Fukushima catastrophe. They feared a demonic chain reaction of atomic reactor meltdowns and pool fires. Six reactors, well, three operating at Daiichi, but seven pools at Daiichi four operating reactors at Daini and four pools, one reactor and one pool at Tokai, closer to Tokyo. And that's where the headlines came from about the possibility of having to evacuate Tokyo if that worst case scenario had played out. 30 million people. But something that the filmmaker Kurosawa envisioned in his film Dreams in 1990 in the part called Mount Fuji in Red atomic reactors exploding behind Mount Fuji, as seen from Tokyo. So here are the explosions at the Unit 1 and the Unit 3, and the aftermath in mid-March of 2011. But it's not the, uh, the first time, and I should mention that the, uh, the reactors, of course, are General Electric Mark I boiling water reactors, so there's an instant tie between this Japanese catastrophe and U.S. involvement. <clears throat> but of course, our, our nuclear involvement, so to speak, goes back 70 years. And we just held a conference in Chicago to mark the 70th year since Enrico Fermi fired up the first atomic reactor in the world, the Chicago Pile 1, as part of the Manhattan Project, uh, the race for the bomb. So you can see an image, an artist's rendition of the pile there. And this is uh, Enrico Fermi. And the, the title of the conference was A Mountain of Radioactive Waste 70 Years High. So um, of course, this was all about the bomb. And uh, these are images of the mushroom clouds at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so the radioactive risks began with the bomb project. And I should have mentioned that Enrico Fermi took a calculated risk, or maybe it was an uncalculated risk, at the University of Chicago. The original plan was to build that prototype reactor some 20 miles, 30 miles outside of town, where Argonne is now located. And uh, there was no time. They couldn't do it in time. So they decided to just do it at the University of Chicago. They didn't even inform the president of the university. They're doing this on the edge of downtown Chicago, and Fermi convinced his higher-ups that probably it would be okay. But some of his graduate students were assigned the task of what they called the suicide squad, and this was to pour a chemical solution onto the pile if something went wrong. There was another individual called the safety control rod axe man, who literally with his axe would chop a rope that was over a pulley and drop the control rod into the out-of-control reactor. And that term, scram, still sticks in the nuclear power industry. 
But as we saw at Fukushima Daiichi, you can scram a reactor when a 9.0 earthquake strikes, but the decay heat is enough to melt it down if you can't cool the cores. So again, with the history, we see Oppenheimer and Groves at the Trinity blast site. This was the precursor to the Nagasaki plutonium bomb and the aftermath of that shown. They didn't have to test the uranium bomb. It was sure to work, so they didn't test it. But, you know, as has been mentioned by uh, Dr. Fairley and Mary Olson, the, the fallout from the, uh, the Cold War, um, atomic bomb tests and hydrogen bomb tests. And this next section, um, Brian Victoria is right in the front row, so I owe a debt of gratitude to Professor Victoria because I learned history coming to Antioch University Midwest last Earth Day last year that I hadn't known about the early U.S. involvement in the Japanese nuclear power industry. So <clears throat> atomic weapons testing in the Pacific. Uh, just the... In mid-March of 2011, I happened to catch one of the episodes of CBS Evening News with Katie Couric, and it was uh, about Fukushima that day, and they showed these images on the right of the USS Ronald Reagan crew swabbing the decks in radiation protection gear because of being blanketed from Fukushima, and it just harkened back to these images from as early as 1946. And granted, that's a photo op. You can see the sailors are smiling, but they bore the brunt of that health damage over the years and decades after that. They are the atomic veterans. So um, the atom bomb testing going on in the Pacific, a Cold War arms race with the Soviets well underway, and President Eisenhower gives a speech called Atoms for Peace at the United Nations in the early 1950s. And Arjun Makajani at IEER has written just an incredible book, if you haven't read it. It's called The Nuclear Power Deception. It came out in 1999, and I learned a lot about the propaganda machine, which was Atoms for Peace. Because uranium mining and milling and processing and enrichment all had to be expanded for this arms race we were in with the Soviets. But how to sell that to the American people? Well, uh, Atoms for Peace. It put a smiley face facade on this major expansion of all things nuclear. And remember, this is the early 1950s. The first so-called civilian atomic reactor was not fired up in Shipping Port, Pennsylvania, under the direction of the head of the nuclear navy. So it's a civilian project, but it's a nuclear submarine reactor built on land, just to get it going. A lot or even most or even all of the uranium in this country that was being milled, being mined and milled and processed and enriched was feeding the arms race for not years but decades until the commercial industry started to really show up in the 1970s and then the uranium supply started to shift over somewhat to fuel those reactors. So this, uh, again, the history that I learned from um, Brian Victoria, Castle Bravo was a Castle was a series of hydrogen bomb tests that the United States carried out at places like Bikini. And on March 1st of 1954, the Bravo test got a little out of control. Uh, Edward Teller was involved in designing this bomb, as were other uh, scientists, and they miscalculated the yield of this explosion. They expected a five megaton blast, and they got more like a 15 megaton blast. And it, it still is the worst radiological um, contamination incident in the history of U.S. nuclear weapons testing. And this uh, Japanese tuna fishing boat, the Lucky Dragon No. 5, was unfortunately not very far away. You can see in the map on the right there, the blast bikini marked by a B, the, the Lucky Dragon marked by the F. They were outside of the zone that the United States had declared off-limits. But, but then later, uh, they redrew the danger zone, and they were well within that danger zone. And over time, uh, half of the crew of 23 died of their radiation exposures. One of the deaths occurred pretty quickly, within a matter of months. And it led to uh, an anti-nuclear groundswell in Japan, including a petition drive with many tens of millions of signatures against atomic bomb tests and against hydrogen bomb tests, and a million signatures alone from Hiroshima area. And the United States became very worried because there was uh, uh, this, this large groundswell of opposition to, to the nuclear energy establishment. And there were fears that uh, 
even the Soviet Union or China could take advantage of this situation and it's in the competition for loyalties after World War II. So again, the, the juxtaposition of images old and new. So on the left, uh, officials from the city of Tokyo testing the tuna from the Lucky Dragon and finding severe contamination. But like Cindy talked about, some of that tuna had already been sold, had already been consumed before it was, it was quarantined. And then on the right, this is actually an image from Thailand, not from Japan, but also dealing with the contamination of seafood post Fukushima. And uh, this was brand new to me that I learned from uh, my visit to Antioch. So um, a part of the United States response to try to shore up Adams for Peace was to actually deploy the Central Intelligence Agency to Japan. And this individual on the left is Louis Strauss, the head of the Atomic Energy Commission. And the Atomic Energy Commission took a lead role in downplaying the significance of the food contamination in Japan. And this individual on the right, Shariki, uh, a fascinating story um, compared to Citizen Kane of Japan, a media mogul who controlled one of the largest newspapers, one of the largest television stations in Japan, had higher ambitions for political office, was a founder of the Liberal Democratic Party of Japan, and in 2006 it was documented that he was uh, working with the Central Intelligence Ag Agency under a couple code names, and one of his assignments was to sell nuclear power to the Japanese people, and he did it with a passion. And so the, the infamous nuclear village was born. And this image is just one example. The speaker from the investigation by the Japanese parliament showed other images of the propaganda used. This is a plutonium boy. And of course, these are geared for children. And uh, so exhibits were shown across the country, just as they were here in the United States, uh, traveling exhibits. And I, during my time in Japan in 2010, I went to one of these kind of Disneyland-like experiences at a nuclear power plant which are really geared for young children. And one of the first companies to uh, take advantage of this situation was uh, a company that Mr. Shariki worked with, and that was General Dynamics that got in early on the nuclear business in Japan. But, but um, General Electric was not too far behind. So Here's uh, you know, a grand total of about 140 atomic reactors in the US. Uh, 104 are still operating, but you gotta take off Crystal River, Florida, 103 now. Take off Kewanee, Wisconsin, 102. Uh, sorry that Canada is not on the map because there are you know, 20 plus reactors in Canada, but take off Gentil 2 in Quebec. So there are dominoes on the brink of tipping over and we need to shut them down before they melt down. This is Atomic Japan, third only to the United States, and then France with 58 reactors, Japan with 54, plus Manju, the fast breeder reactor. One of the places in Japan, Fukui Prefecture, a remarkable number of reactors, more than a dozen, along a short stretch of coastline. And what I want to do for the next section of the talk is just go through the parallels between US and Japanese nuclear history in terms of accidents, incidents. They're remarkably parallel. And what I took was just an arbitrary list. The Associated Press, shortly after the beginning of the Fukushima catastrophe, put a list of, you know, a short list of 10 or so Japanese nuclear accidents that had already occurred before Fukushima. So I took that list, because it could be much longer, and I compared it to ones here in North America. So you see on the left, uh, Suruga nuclear power plant, but you see on the right, the Bruce uh, nuclear power plant in Ontario. This is worker overexposures. So in 1981, 300 workers were exposed to excessive levels of radiation after a fuel rod ruptured at Suruga. And it reminded me of an incident in uh, Michigan at Big Rock Point, an uh, experimental atomic reactor, where a MOX fuel rod was broken in the 1970s and 700,000 curies of radioactivity were, were released. But Bruce is also on the Great Lakes in Canada. And uh, just recently, in 2009, there was an exposure of hundreds of workers to alpha particle radiation when they were grinding through contaminated pipes. They had no respiratory protection on. And before moving on from the Bruce slide, I just wanted to mention that this is one of the biggest nuclear power plants, certainly in North America, it's the biggest, and even in the world. There's a total of nine reactors on this site. 
They're even proposing a low and intermediate level radioactive waste dump for all of Ontario's 20 reactors worth of wastes, a burial site, uh, 400 yards from the water of Lake Huron. But there are a half dozen communities mostly populated by Bruce workers that want to be the high level radioactive waste dump for all of Canada. And the Great Lakes is 20% of the world's surface fresh water, drinking water supply for 40 million people in North America. So this next uh, parallel is sodium fires. And you see Manju and Fukui Prefecture suffered a bad sodium fire in 1995. Uh, videotape footage of the damage was concealed for a time and then later got released. But um, Fermi Unit 1 in Monroe County, Michigan suffered a sodium fire, suffered tritium leaks in 2008. And what's remarkable about that is it had permanently shut down in 1972. These were decommissioning accidents at Fermi 1. Fermi 1 was made famous or infamous by an October 5th, 1966 partial meltdown of the reactor core captured in the book, We Almost Lost Detroit. So talk about a cover-up. That was a 10-year cover-up of a partial meltdown in Michigan until John Fuller wrote this book. The next uh, parallels reprocessing plant fires and explosions. Now this is a lesser known accident at Tokai Mura in Japan. Uh, March 11, 1997, ironically the same date as the later Fukushima catastrophe. And uh, 40 workers were exposed to radiation in this reprocessing. So the parallel in the United States is right here in the state of New York at West Valley near Buffalo, a commercial reprocessing facility that operated from 1966 to 1972. But they had so many fires and leaks and worker overexposures at West Valley that they only did one year's worth of reprocessing throughput. They also did military reprocessing at that site. And the cleanup bill at West Valley is between 10 and $27 billion. And it's not even hardly begun. And if they do not clean that site up, it is going to erode into Lakes Erie and Ontario over time. So it has to be cleaned up. So the more uh, infamous nuclear disaster at Tokaimura was the inadvertent criticality of 1999. Two workers died from their radiation exposures. And another inadvertent criticality took place in 1999, but again, the truth was covered up for eight years, and it wasn't known that there had been a 30-minute, uh, I believe, criticality in the reactor core. Sorry, 15 minutes. Uh, and a similar thing had happened at Fermi Unit 2, which I'll show on this slide. Fermi 2, which is the biggest General Electric Mark I boiling water reactor in the world, same design as Fukushima Daiichi, only as big as units one and two at Fukushima Daiichi put together. They had an inadvertent criticality in 1985. And the watchdog, Michael Keegan, with Don't Waste Michigan, outed it, and it kept that reactor shut down for three years because they, they didn't have a permit to run the reactor. They just did it accidentally. Luckily, no one was hurt. So the safety cover-ups uh, continued. Tokyo Electric Power Company, the book about Tokyo Electric is called Dark Empire. So it starts to capture their, uh, their behavior. So um, in 2000, three TEPCO executives were forced to resign after the revelation that in 1989, the company had ordered an employee to edit out footage showing cracks in nuclear plant steam pipes in video that was shown to regulators. Of course, they eventually were allowed to restart their reactors. And uh, there was another cover-up in Japan that was outed by the Japanese anti-nuclear movement. Eileen Miyoko-Smith at uh, Green Action told me this story. The British Nuclear Fuel Limited mocks fuel supply with falsified um, quality assurance figures that it took tremendous efforts to uh, document this, but they did, that those were falsified figures. They simply photocopied the results of earlier batches, so to speak, cut and paste, which caused a huge delay in the plutonium thermal loading in Japan. So another cover-up I want to mention here in the United States is davis Bessey, Ohio, which had a, a massive corrosion hole in the lid of the reactor in 2002 and operated to within 3 sixteenths of an inch of breaching the lid through nearly seven inches of carbon steel. And again, cover-ups, video footage was edited before the NRC was allowed to see it. This photograph, though, the NRC had in its possession, still did not take action. This is a, a lava stream, so to speak, of boric acid crystals and rust 
coming off of the lid. And the former NRC chairman, Richard Meserve, his fingerprints are all over this near disaster. Junior inspectors at NRC wanted to shut the plant down, inspect, see what was going on. Meserve and other senior management at NRC allowed the reactor to operate to the brink of disaster. And the Office of Inspector General at NRC later reported that NRC had prioritized company profits over public safety. Meserve resigned shortly after that report and uh, unfortunately is still brought to Tokyo as in December for consultation on nuclear safety matters. He also is the chairman of all things nuclear at the National Academy of Science, even though he serves on two for-profit nuclear utility corporate boards, Pacific Gas and Electric in California and Comanche in Texas. And uh, through grassroots activism was forced to recuse himself from the current radiation study on cancer incidents associated with nuclear power plants in the United States. So more examples of the, the close parallels between the US and Japan. There have been not radioactive, but steam accidents where workers have been killed. So at Mihama, Unit 3 in Fukui, again, four workers were killed after a steam explosion. The subsequent investigation revealed a significant lack of systematic inspections at Japanese nuclear power plants. Surrey in Virginia, which David Lockbaum mentioned yesterday, may have cleaned up its act a bit after two separate steam fatality accidents. Um, one killed two workers in 1972, another one killed four workers in 1986, and that's the single largest loss of life uh, at a at nuclear power plant in the United States. Surrey's also infamous because they're experimenting with dry cask storage out there. They have a real smorgasbord of different cast models, and they've had problems. They've had leaks of the inerting uh, heat transfer gas um, out of one seal, perhaps out of a second seal. It hasn't leaked completely out, but if it does, oxygen can get in, the waste can overheat, and you can have corrosion of deterioration of the fuel inside. This slide is about radioactive steam releases. Now, these are not scalding people to death, but they do contain radioactivity that then leaves the site. Daiichi had such an incident in 2006. A really uh, controversial one was the January 2012 steam release from a failed steam generator tube at San Onofre in Southern California. Uh, the two units at San Onofre are still shut down 14 months now due to uh, a faulty design and fabrication of steam generator replacements, which cost $617 million. And for details on that, Arnie Gunderson is the expert witness for Friends of the Earth on this matter, and uh, hopefully those reactors will never start up again. There's a groundswell of anti-nuclear uh, um, activism in Southern California to keep them shut down. So earthquake risks. Um, before Daiichi, there was the 2007 quake, ironically on the Trinity atomic blast anniversary at Kajiwazaki Kariwa, which is the largest nuclear power plant in the world, seven large-scale reactors, some of which had begun to come back to service, but then the 2011 earthquake catastrophe, of course, has shut down all operable reactors in Japan except for two in Fukui Prefecture at the Oe nuclear power plant. Earthquake risks at Indian Point. Indian Point happens to be located immediately adjacent to earthquake faults that were not known about when it was constructed. And seismologists at Columbia University confirmed their existence in 2008, and the NRC has been forced to admit that this is probably the most vulnerable nuclear power plant in the country to earthquake risks because it wasn't built that well. Granted, Diablo Canyon and San Onofre are still vulnerable to earthquakes and tsunamis, but they were built more strongly because there was a recognition that San Andreas was right there. Indian Point, they had no such appreciation. And this image shows Indian Point in the distant background on the Hudson River, and uh, Mrs. Sas Sashiko Sato, a Fukushima organic farmer, Eileen Miyoko-Smith from Green Action, and also an organic farmer from Hokkaido, and another leader of the anti-nuclear movement in Hokkaido, we went up to visit the Indian Point Safe Energy Coalition folks. That was September 2012. So um, this is just the cover of the New Yorker, another haunting image from, from March of uh, 2011 that was published on the date of the Three Mile Island anniversary, actually, March 28th. And uh, so I just wanted to go to some additional risks that weren't mentioned in that AP article from March of 2011 in Japan and their parallels in the US. 
reactor pressure vessel embrittlement, the neutron bombardment of the eight inch or so metal walls of a reactor pressure vessel over years and decades, and the, the impurities in the metal creating cracks which can line up, and if the emergency core cooling systems are ever activated, the final line of defense to prevent a meltdown, the, the thermal shock of the temperature decrease combined with the high pressure can crack these vessels. And if that happens, it would be uh, an, un, uh, an irreparable loss of coolant accident. There's no contingency in place. So the worst in Japan, the worst in the United States, another Entergy atomic reactor, just like Indian Point. Risks that have been mentioned are the high-level radioactive waste storage pools that are not located in radiological containment structures. Bob Alvarez talked about that much better than I can. Um, we're having headlines about leaks at Hanford, and the irony of this is it harkens back 70 years, really, because Hanford generated the plutonium for the Nagasaki atomic bomb, continued to for the Cold War arsenal. Well, those high-level radioactive waste liquid and sludge storage tanks, the single-shelled ones, when they leak, it's directly into the environment. The first double shell had a leak in August. Granted, it's between the walls of the two shells and not out yet, but it shows there's problems. Leaks at high-level radioactive waste storage pools in the United States. There are more than a half dozen pools in the U.S. that have uh, documented leaks. Indian Point's pool leak is ongoing as we speak. Brookhaven's is uh, very significant because millions of people drink the water in the aquifer under Long Island. So fault solutions, a big fight that's coming our way, centralized interim storage. They want to uh, put the waste onto the roads, the rails, the waterways, including the Hudson River, is possibly targeted for 58 barge shipments of high-level radioactive waste from Indian Point down to the port of Jersey City. To get it to parking lot dumps, whether at a place like Savannah River site on the right here, um, or waste isolation pilot plant in New Mexico, or Native American reservations out west. All for what? To create a shell game on the roads and rails and waterways because if it goes to a parking lot dump for 50 years, it may have to go right back to where it came from for permanent disposal. It accomplishes nothing except transfer of liability onto the American taxpayer from the utilities that profited from the generation. I mentioned the good news at Kiwani of shutdown. The only two reactors in Japan currently operating are these, OE but the other 48 operable reactors in the country are not operating, and it's a real testament to the Japanese people and anti-nuclear movement. A lot of this has already been talked about by previous speakers. The 1972 warnings that the Mark I was a catastrophically flawed reactor. Um, the, the GE3 blew the whistle in 1976. Uh, also in 1986, the, the NRC's point man at Three Mile Island warned about the Mark I. So we have a campaign at Beyond Nuclear called Freeze Our Fukushimas. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of the Fukushima catastrophe beginning, we prioritize the Mark I's and Mark II's. If we can't shut these down for safety risks, then you know, what can we shut down after, after Fukushima? The Japanese parliament identified collusion between regulator and industry as the root cause of the Fukushima catastrophe. We have collusion in spades in the United States between the nuclear power industry, and here are four of the five NRC commissioners. They are poised to pass a majority vote against putting filters on the vents at the Mark I's and Mark II's, bowing to pressure from industry and from House Republicans. So uh, Gene Stilp, who's a watchdog on Three Mile Island, a survivor of the accident, lives in Harrisburg, showed up in Michigan in 1999 with a banner that said, Three Mile Island, this is a Bob Deltradici photo, Chernobyl, and he said, where next? And of course, we have to add Fukushima to the list, and we again have to ask, where next? We have to shut them down before they melt down. Thank you.